Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we live like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson here with Greg Ettinger and Brian Broom, and today we're talking about the lost empire of Assyria. Um, we're in Isaiah in terms of our grand march through scripture. Last week we talked about conspiracy theory, um, and Assyria, as it turns out, is one more conspiracy in history. Um, We'll talk a little bit about the new world order that it was trying to form. Um, But first, let's place it in history. Where did Assyria come from? Take us back to the beginning, won't you, Greg? (laughs) Okay. All the way back to Genesis. All the way back to Genesis. We never get away from it, do we? Nope. After the story of Noah that most people are at least vaguely familiar with, certainly Christians ought to be, There are two chapters that very often we sort of skip through. One of them, um, the chapter 10, it contains what's called the Table of Nations. It's a list. It's a sort of genealogy of whose children Shem, Ham, and Jesus were. Who who did they begat? And then who did they begat? And what nations Mm -hmm. came of this? That's the one that most people say, I don't know these names. And there's obviously nothing of spiritual value here, so I will skip to chapter 11. And then you run into the Tower of Babel, which most people are familiar with, and that takes up about less than half of the chapter. And then you get more genealogy. So we skip ahead, brother, and (laughs) run into Abraham, and now we're on familiar ground. But the Table of Nations does form a sort of um, literary visual background for everything that follows in the Old Testament. It's it. uh, You remember in the uh, in the old days when you went and watched a movie? Well. In your case, when you watch an old movie on new technology, uh, all the credits are up front. Mm-hmm. There was a simple reason for that. If you put them at the back, that's what people no would do. No one will watch. No one will watch. Everyone <laughs> walk out of the theater. So no the, one the uh, credit, and obviously that's the worst thing. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. Are you among those? I, I know the Farshmans and the Eddingers and a few others are among those who are committed to staying to the last bitter end of the last credit that rolls. <laughs> as, as uh, you know, um, recognition of the, mm-hmm. all of these people were involved. We get yeah, to see what know, babies were born. Be. Mm-hmm. And then in- I had a friend in college who would always stay. And it wasn't like he stated an expectation that we would always stay. We just always did. Uh-huh. <laughs> and that stuck with me. It entirely depends upon the movie in question. <laughs> and I obviously, I, I think Marvel trained us all very well to sit oh, yes. through the end of oh, their yeah. movies. But... Um, Ma- mainly what I have here is uh, an idea of a dig against bad movies where I will not sit through the ending of credits of movies I did not enjoy seeing. Well, yeah, that that's perfectly <laughs> reasonable. I mean, the, it's like tipping the waitress. If she did a good job, you should be nice. And if she didn't, well, you know, stiffer. Um, <laughs> but uh, the, the analogy there is you, you put those up, not, not merely to give credit where credit was due, but often – your cast of characters would show up. So and so's playing so and so, someone plays so and so. So that as it begins, you would have some idea of who to expect to see. Uh, and, and that's the sort of the function of the Table of Nations. Yeah, it's great for those who study ethnography and ancient geography and all those kind of things. But in terms of the this the story of the Bible itself, we get to find out what peoples related to what peoples. And sometimes that becomes really important later on for interpreting the Bible. For instance, it's only by reading the Table of Nations that you find out that the Philistines were descended from a tribe that was descended from Egypt. In other words, Mm -hmm. the Philistines were an offshoot of Egypt. They were an Egyptian colony. So when we get to the later parts of Genesis and beyond, every time we see Philistines, we should should think, oh, these are Neo-Egyptians, and interpret the text in terms of that. God's bringing Egypt forward in the person of their avatars. And that's kind of important. Mm-hmm. Uh, Egypt we, keeps chasing yeah. Israel back into bondage. Yeah. And when we, and then when the Ark of the Covenant goes into Philistia mm-hmm. uh, in cap, captivity and <laughs> then destroys its gods and brings plagues, you say, oh, we know this. These, these are mm-hmm. Egyptians and gods replaying the Exodus on a smaller scale. Okay, we get that. Oh, that helps tie things together. There are a few nations that really do not show up at all until you get to Ezekiel. And you can think here of um, Magog, for instance. Mm. 
And anybody who studies eschatology knows Gog and Magog. Gog, and originally, Gog is the prince of Magog. But the very fact that it that it's, doesn't put in an appearance after the Table of Nations till Ezekiel means it wasn't one of the immediate neighbors, and therefore, we're to understand in Ezekiel, the immediate neighbors, God's already dealt with. Now, the further off threats are coming, and God's going to deal with those too. And some of those names are not much, so much chosen to say, you know, this or that nation is coming, but God's got everything. He, he took care of the, of the close threats. He's going to get the distant threats. He's got, he's got all of the nations. Any nation that can rise up against you, God knows about. He's cataloged it. He's got it in check. And when, when he's finally ready to release it on you, he'll be right there to deal with it too. So uh, that and other things. Well, anyway. It's also, yeah. <laughs> if we take, I forget exactly which psalm this phrasing shows up in, but I always love that, you know, the nations are as dust on the scales. It's not even that, oh, I've taken account of it. I've I've sent out, I've got my accountants ready. Mm-hmm. We've allocated the proper resources. It's mm-hmm. like, yeah, we'll just send an angel at one point, you know, <laughs> if it becomes necessary. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's so little, it doesn't even show up on the scale. You yeah. can just run a dust cloth over it. It's fine. <laughs> and that, that is the image. And that's uh, one of Isaiah's images, where since we're in Isaiah. Uh, among the sons of Shem, I, I will read, unto him were children born, Elam, the Elamites, that's the area where that Persia will come into and take over. They're, it's not, these are not Persians, but they're, it's, it's what will become Persian territory. And then the second one is Asher. And then our facts had led Aram, that's um, the Arameans who spoke Aramaic, which was the language that the Jews used when Christ came to earth, uh, and some others. There's not a lot of nations that sent from, from Shem, but one of them is this, this people called Asher. Now, an interesting thing, if we back up to several verses, we run into um, Ham's children, and one of Ham's children was Cush. He is the Ethiopians who began to settle in Arabia, but eventually crossed over and went into uh, Africa and became the nation that we now know or remember as as Ethiopia or Abyssinia at one time. Mm-hmm. Um, but Cush begat Nimrod. There's no, I think there's only one other reference to Nimrod beyond this passage. And in that context, it does call Assyria, it's one of the minor prophets, and I forget which one. Assyria is the land of Nimrod, and this is why. Cush begat Nimrod, he began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord, wherefore it said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. Well, wait, but, but what does that have to do with Asher? Asher is a child of, of Shem. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Erech, and Akkad, and Kalna, the land of Shinar. Now, the King James reads it this way, and out of that land went forth Asher and builded Nineveh, the city of Rehoboth, Kala, and, and there's some more cities. The marginal note, though, on that on verse 10, says where, where the name Asher appears, he, that is Nimrod, went out into Asher, into Assyria, mm-hmm. and built Nimrod. And again, uh, Assyria and Nineveh is called later on the, uh, the land of Nimrod. First of all, who's this Nimrod guy? <laughs> uh the ancient world obviously knew when you can drop it, you've got nations you're dealing with, multitudes of people covering a long period of time. And you you pick out one single person and say, and of course there was this guy, Nimrod. Obviously he was really important and the whole world knew, oh, him, yeah. Mighty hunter, sure was. Empire builder, mm-hmm. yeah. And that's where we get the saying, like Nimrod. A like hunter, Nimrod, like, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. <laughs> it's in their idiomatic expression. Yeah, <laughs> it had passed into, it, into idiom. The problem is, uh, the secular histories don't know him by that name. By that name. That doesn't mean we do, they don't know him. There are a couple of contenders who he might be, or who, in fact, all might be the same person. But there, if, if you look at a secular history, and say, who was the first major empire builder in Mesopotamia? They'll say Sargon of Akkad. If you ask... Not the British political commentator. No. <laughs> You're kidding. Uh, <laughs> no, it's, it's a real guy. I, um, yeah, okay. I, that one I don't know. Or if you look at who built Nineveh, you'll find uh, one Ninus, um, who may uh, also be the same man. It's... 
we there was a time when archaeology took the Bible very seriously. Um, I have uh, Sir Walter Raleigh's History of the World. He was a, a very good scholar for his time and place. Uh, he took the Bible very seriously, and as he's writing, he's arguing with other scholars who've written before him about who's who and what's what and where's where. Like he has substantial arguments about where the Garden of Eden was located. He's completely wrong because there's some things he doesn't <laughs> understand. But he took it seriously and he believed that everything that was in the Bible was relevant and that came first. And then you fed in the archaeological data, which they had, which at that point was not a lot because archaeology as a science really didn't get started until the late 1800s. But th this was common when, pe when archaeologists would come here and try to figure this out. And there were real discussions of who this Nimrod was, who some of these other characters were. Were they the same character? Were they related? Did one come after another? One was one father and one son. Um, for instance, at Babel, at the tower, um, there are two characters who were named Belus. Well, Belus simply means Lord. And um, because they have because they have the same name, I mean, if in, in American history, if you talked about President Bush, <laughs> well, obviously he's... he must have endured through a few administrations. He must have been the first guy who had you know like was in for six terms because he's serving here and then he's still serving over here. No. And if we didn't, <laughs> if we lost all of the historical information except a few you know headlines from the New York Times, that would be easy to conclude. Mm -hmm. Until you realize, wait, one's a father, one's a son. There's all kinds of stuff that happened in between. Mm -hmm. uh, as we look at uh, the Tower of Babel, there seems to have been two leaders, a father and son. Cush, who is sort of the, the prototype for Hermes or Thoth or Mercury, the one who, the god of language, the <laughs> one who interprets language or uh, disinterprets as the case may be. And then his son, Nimrod, who marries... Uh, or the second Bellus, who marries Samaramis, the great, beautiful, white lady who is the prototype for all the mother-type goddesses. And these were two of the first dead monarchs to be deified. But there's so much there. Now, this was my original point. There's so much material there, but it's so, but there are also so many holes. And archaeology today doesn't believe the Bible. So no one's going to go back and say, but wait, let's start with the Bible and use that as a, a, a framework and then try to fit the data into that. It's more, well, this is my theory, and I can prove it with selective ordering of archaeological detail. The Bible, of course, is irrelevant to archaeology. Um, and, and then we can build our arguments. Well, and it's not even just, oh, we're not going to use the Bible as a framework. It's, we're not even going to count it as a primary source. No, it doesn't count as a primary source. Because in the minds of most secular historians, it wasn't written until after the time of Ezra. Uh, anything that that it records before that was oral tradition or myth, uh, or maybe a few random documents that some scribe found and put together. But no, it's not. It was not contemporary history written when the things happened. So the historians consider the Bible a relatively modern book, usually. And so Christians have not really been in a place to rethink archaeology and to do the investigations. And to say, look, here are the holes that we need to fill if we're going to make sure our answers are right. Start looking, start reading, keep your eyes open, look for the new inscriptions that are just being translated. Look for side references in old books that everyone's ignored. Let's see if we can't put this together. Well, in the meantime, for our purposes, at least, it, it seems that this, these, this people following their father, Asher, moved into the area around the River Tigris. What the Bible, what the Old Testament calls Hittical. And having settled there, along comes Nimrod and conquers it and imposes upon it what he had started, Babel, which is a vision of a one world order symbolized by the ziggurat, whereby man can attain deity. We can build a civilization, a society, a culture that will get us to where the gods are. And Have we done an episode on ziggurats? Yeah, way back at the beginning we did. We okay. did. Yeah. So, so anybody is interested, go back and look at that one, <laughs> uh, which was, it was the one on the Tower of, of Babel or Babel, however yep. you want to pronounce it. So that, so from the beginning, although the Assyrian people were a Semitic people, descended from Sham, very early on, they get stamped with Nimrod's vision. And from there on out, they pretty much maintain it. They never are able to pull away from it, except for one brief generation that listens to this waterlogged, bleached prophet 
<laughs> and and for a little while says, oh. And they return to the god of their great 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 grandfather, and then they have enough that they go on. The they adopt their their great 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 they adopt Asher as the chief of the gods. Otherwise, they pretty much have the Babylonian pantheon. They the Assyrian culture gets drenched in magic. When the ruins of Nineveh were discovered and explored, there were lots of of you know as. Thornton Wilder says in our towns, lots of slave, lots of slave contracts and and wheat bills. <laughs> but beside that, probably half or more were spells. Was magic, hmm. uh, how to cast spells, uh, how to deflect spells, warnings against taboo. The Assyrian culture was was full of taboos. Think, don't do this, or the demons will get you. Don't do this, or the gods will be offended. Don't do this, or a curse comes. And so magic became the way to help you pr- help protect yourself against these things. And the king then was relatively all powerful, but checked again and again by, sorry, sire, uh, it's the thirteenth day of the month, and you know we can't do anything, or the earth will open and swallow us. But that's your superstition. It's the thirteenth of the month, and the earth will open and swallow us. So <laughs> <laughs> fine. Can we move on the fourteenth? Oh, of course. There's nothing wrong with the. Wait, but wait. yeah, 14's clear. We can do that. <sighs> okay. Get ready to move on the fort. <laughs> the thing about Assyria is its lifespan. It is probably the most ancient and most long lived of the great empires. Because it, it's like Dracula, like he keeps coming back from the dead. <laughs> and now he's in London. <laughs> <laughs> he. Uh, if you if you read the histories we know, it goes back to the time of Abraham and before, and then it kind of recedes in power and influence. But by the time we get to the later history of the kings of Israel and Judah, it's back again, and it's had some ups and downs along the way. It's never completely gone out of existence. Now you can almost say the same same thing for Babylon, Babel, because you know we we run into Babel here at the same time. But first, there's the whole tower confusion of tongues thing that doesn't go well. Uh, it gets taken over by various other peoples from time to time. And finally, the Assyrians just slap it down hard. In fact, they destroy it. Uh, we, uh, you remember the story of Hezekiah? Well, this is about where we are. You remember that uh, when Hezekiah is, is having to deal with the Assyrians, he gets sick and he appeals <laughs> to the prophet Isaiah, and Isaiah says, hey, God says you're going to die, get ready for it. Well, he turns to the wall and pouts a little bit and prays to God, and God says to Isaiah, all right, go back and tell him he's got 15 more years. And we have the whole, I want a sign. Fine, you want the sundial to go forward and back? Oh, make it go backward. Make the sun go back in the sky. All right. Oh, that's so great. 15 more years. It's at this time the Babylonian ambassadors show up and say, we just just saw the sun move in the sky, because we watched (laughs) the stars in that. and." we heard you were sick and you're better. We just wanted to offer our uh, hearty congratulations, our concerns for your well-being, and you know maybe there's a possibility of some alliance here because you know Siri is really mean and nasty, and they don't like us, and they probably aren't going to like you either. Um, so um, yeah, well, let me show you everything I have. That would be uh, nice. Yeah. And so Hezekiah not- shows him all his treasures. Isaiah is off doing something, and he comes back and sees the the Babylonian ambassadors leave. Who were these men? Oh, uh, they were ambassadors from some small town far away, someplace called Babylon. Uh Aha. What have you shown them? I showed them everything. There is nothing of all that I have I did not show them. Uh Aha. And this is why Jesus said to be cunning as serpents as well as innocent as doves. Yeah, this is where you open your your fake treasures and show <laughs> yeah. them the cobwebs. I wish, you know, we used to have oh, so much. Oh, yeah, you know, we're really on rough times lately. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is not a place we really want to come. What were we thinking? But, you know, the Babylonians being stargazers see the sun move. Yeah, this, this, whoever got this, whoever has a God who can do this, that's someone we want on our side. The king those ambassadors worked for was a man who is called Merodach Baladan. He was a tr- perennial troublemaker for the Assyrians. He took over Babylon and tried to raise a ruckus, and they chased him out. And then after a while, he came back and, and tried it again, and they chased him out. 
And he came back and tried it again. And finally, I don't know if they, if, I don't remember if they actually caught him and killed him, but they made sure he never came back. And they completely annihilated the city. They wiped it out. We're not doing that. We're not playing this game anymore. You're gone. There's nothing there anymore. And for a generation or two, it was just sand. But then in the days of Esarhaddon, the king who comes after Sennacherib and after Hezekiah and the kings we know, this Esarhaddon said, wouldn't it be nice to have a city there? Let's build one. And we'll get these people called Chaldeans to run it. It'll be great for trade and all that. And so Babylon gets rebuilt and thus becomes the, the center of the Neo-Babylonian or Chaldean Empire. Mm. Meanwhile, Assyria has kept ticking. And in this uh, revamped image that we find in the Hezekiah's story before that, the Ahaz history, and the things that follow in Isaiah, the whole Isaiah's whole Christmas sermon, it, it's getting mean and nasty. It is a war machine. It's, it's very successful. All of its funds are dedicated to war and aggression. Uh, and they're being moved by this Babylonian philosophy that they have been permeated now with for centuries, except now they feel that they are the ones to carry the torch, lead forth the banners, and create a new world order. The new world order, again, it's going to mean a unified humanity, like the Tower of Babel, which means a unified religion and philosophy, a unified worldview where everyone will share a serious take on things, unified political control uh, through an expanded and powerful, all-seeing, all-knowing bureaucracy. And in order to accomplish this, we need, first of all, to destroy all local loyalties. So if a nation just happens to really love us and say, ooh, we all want to be just like you, we, will, we too are Assyrians. Okay, we'll, we'll see how that works. But anyone who dares oppose us, uh, yeah, that's, that's not going to work. So we'll take their populations and scatter them abroad throughout our empire. And I, I believe I said this maybe last time. that mm -hmm. So what's going to happen, and what happened to the northern tribes, the northern, northern Israel, is one day you wake up in your new locale and you find... The neighbor on the right is Egyptian, the neighbor on the left is Syrian, the guy across the street is a Philistine, the guy around the corner comes from some place called uh, Greece or something, you know, and eventually you none of the, you don't speak the same language, you don't have the same culture, you don't worship the same gods, you have one thing in common. You are citizens of the Assyrian Empire, and you work for them, and they make the rules. And there's no two ways about it. There's no nonsense about democracy or self-determination, or any of that, your homeland has been destroyed. It, do, it does not exist as your nation anymore. Your nation's gone. And that sends mass genocide. Because, you know, God must be one. And so unity becomes absolutely essential to this Assyrian worldview. Uh, diversity? No. There's no need for that. Uh, the other thing that went with this, I, I've hinted at it, uh, they were ferocious. They used terror as one of their main, main weapons. If uh, you oppose them, when the battle was over, they would often go out and find all the dead bodies, presumably dead, although I don't think they were picky about it, and then skin them. And they would take those human skins to the next, the, the next city they were planning on attacking and nail them to the wall of the next city as a message. This is what's coming for you unless you open your gates right now and surrender to us. Uh, is and this, they, by any chance, the inspiration for the Reavers in Firefly? Uh, I do not know how much history he read, but very much possibly, yeah. So that sounds I mean, very familiar. Yeah, doesn't it? <laughs> you know, I mean, there's only so many wicked, horrible things you can do. And, Mm -hmm. Assyria pretty much did them. Now, as we follow biblical history from here uh, through Babylon to Media Persia to Greece and to Rome, the same vision maintains, but with slightly different emphasis. The Babylonians don't uh, try to destroy national cultures. They make use of them. They take the best and the brightest, send them to their version of Yale and Harvard, educate them in the ways of Babylonian thought, and then send them back to be the leaders of their people. Except now they're brainwashed and they work for Babylon. The uh, Persians were much nicer. They basically said, you can have everything you've always had, just pay our taxes and provide men for our <laughs> war machine. We don't care about anything else, just behave yourselves. 
which is why the Bible actually does look upon them with some favor. Greece, you know, we all need to be good Greeks. Alexander didn't have much time to do with that. He was too busy fighting and then died, but his followers kind of insisted on. Yeah, Greek uh, Greek philosophy, not so much the religion, but the Greek philosophies, religious, they were religious philosophies. <laughs> That's where we're going. Rome comes along and says, we don't care about much of anything. You can do whatever you want. Just well, there's one provision. You need to put a pinch of incense on this altar and say, this only works because Caesar is Lord. So you can have your religion, your churches, your whatever, uh, uh, once you get a license from the state. Once you admit the state, Caesar, is in control of everything by divine right, that's all we really need from you. Don't need any more. Just, you know, get the 666 tattoo on your forehead and we're cool. <laughs> Um, so this new world order, this vision of one controlling worldview that's backed by politics and bureaucracy and armies, but also works subtly, well, not so much with Assyria, but with later, works subtly through education to mind shift the population. This is what God's people were living through. Uh, and so when we look around today, and some of these things should sound real familiar, like, you know, yesterday's headlines or tomorrow's. Um, we need to understand that God's people have seen all this. They've seen it come and go. They've seen it in five different flavors. <laughs> and at no point was God out of control. <laughs> in fact, um, as Brian said earlier, the nations don't count. They are dust and less than dust. Uh, <laughs> it's not that, and again, appreciate um, the way Brian, the, the angle Brian was taking. It's not simply that God says, oh, there's a threat to my people. I must do something. It's that God has set this up for the good of his people. Assyria came for the good of God's people. Babylon came for the good of God's people. Ultimately, for the good of the gospel, for the good of bringing Christ into the world. It was absolutely essential in the way that God had planned things that these nations rise to power and then fall on his time schedule. And God's people had to learn to accept that. As you read through the, particularly the minor prophets, but the latter parts of Isaiah, of Jeremiah, of Ezekiel, Daniel most certainly, this is an ongoing theme. And when you get to the Gospels, it's assumed. You know, the Gospels open, and here's this new empire that we hadn't heard of before called Rome, and it's got Judea under its thumb. How could God possibly bring the Messiah about? Well, <laughs> read the Gospels. <laughs> he, he Funny needed, you should ask. <laughs> yeah, he needs Rome to be there because somebody has to declare him righteous and then kill him. And then someone has to, <laughs> someone has to destroy Israel. And, execute and then the God's stone wrath. has to come rolling down from Babylon to knock down the statue. Yeah, exactly. So God's people had to learn to walk by faith in the face of this. When we get to Isaiah uh, and the Christmas sermon, Assyria is the political backdrop. Last time, actually the time before last, we saw that it is the Assyrian threat to the north that leads uh, the northern kingdom, Israel, and their former enemy, Syria, Aram, to try to make a league and try to include Judah, and Judah won't go along. And so they decide they're going to attack Judah, subdue it, put in a puppet king, unite with Egypt, and form a large political bloc against Assyria. And the, the Christmas sermon begins with, that's not going to happen, Isaiah comes to tell King Ahaz. Um, God's going to get rid of these two nations to the north. Uh, and you just need to trust me. And if you don't, then that's something else then, isn't it? But if you want a sign, I'll give you a sign anywhere. And Ahaz says, I will not ask neither will I tempt the Lord. Great. Well, that's really arrogant. The Lord himself will give you a sign. A virgin will conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel. In other words, we just, God is at this point by passing the, the Davidic line. Yes, uh, somehow the Messiah will be the seed of David, but apparently not yours, because we don't need you, King Ahaz. We don't need your seed. We don't need your line. We don't need your political kingdom. All the things you think that God somehow finds necessary in you, you are out to lunch. God has this all planned, and you are no longer part of the plan. So and then he brings up Assyria. Assyria is coming, and it's going to take out Syria. It's going to take out Israel, and then it's coming for you. Then we have a break, and we come back, and then the, the whole conspiracy thing. They're not listening, really, because God's saying, don't worry about Israel, and don't worry about Syria, but Assyria, Asher, yeah, they're going to be a problem. 
But we're still scared of these two powers that are next door. They're, they're confederate against us. They're conspiring against us. Conspiracies rule the world. And we saw last time. No, they don't. Not to say they don't, that they can't be effective in a limited sense because God needs them to be effective sometimes. Sometimes not so much. He ordains that they are effective. <laughs> he, or, he ordains that they are effective despite themselves, despite that sin is stupid and sinners mm -hmm. stab each other in the back routinely. God will let them prosper long enough to get done what he needs to get done. You know, it's one thing for Satan to work with broken tools. Um, <laughs> he can't very well, but he tries really hard. God <laughs> can use broken tools all he wants because he can just hold them together until he's done and then he lets go and they fall apart. And when you get to chapter... 10, skipping 9 for the moment, Assyria again is brought to the floor. And the image here is, in fact, let me let me read a little bit. This is how the prophet or how God describes Assyria. He turns to Assyria and says, this is chapter 10, verse 5, O Assyrian, the rod of my anger and the staff in their hand is mine indignation. I will send him against a hypocritical nation, Judah. And against the people of my wrath will I give him a charge to take the spoil, to take the prey, and to tread them down like the mire of the street. So God says, yeah, Assyria is just a rod in my hand so I can discipline my people, and it's really going to hurt. However, the Assyrians, that's not what's in their minds. Howbeit he, Assyria, meaneth not so, neither doth his heart think so, but it's in his heart to destroy and cut off nations, not a few. For he saith, are not my princes altogether kings? Is not Kalno, is Carchemish, is not Hamath, is, they're comparing cities that they have conquered with cities they want to conquer. Is not Samaria as Damascus, they've taken out Damascus, Samaria is about to go. As my hand hath found the kingdoms of the idols, whose graven images did excel them of Jerusalem and Samaria, shall I not, as I have done to Samaria and her idols, so do to Jerusalem and her idols? Wait, Jerusalem's not supposed to have idols. Mm -hmm. But the, the king is saying, you know, I've done my research. Um, all these towns, one by one, have fallen, um, and Samaria is not much better than, better than Damascus, and Jerusalem's no better than Samaria. In fact, uh, their, their idols aren't as impressive. They're not as big. They're not as uh, colossal. They don't have so much gold. And Jerusalem's idols are rather poor and pathetic anyway. Jerusalem wasn't supposed to have idols. <laughs> Wherefore, it shall come to pass that when the Lord hath performed his whole work upon Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, I will punish the fruit of the stout heart of the king of Assyria and the glory of his high looks. For he says, by the strength of my hand I have done it, and by my wisdom, for I am prudent. I have removed the bounds of the people, you know, the forced translocation. I have robbed their treasures. I have put down the inhabitants like a valiant man, and my hand hath found as a nest the riches of the people, and as one gathereth eggs that are left, have I gathered all the earth. And there was none that moved a wing, or opened his mouth, or peeped. Shall the axe boast itself against him that heweth therewith? Or shall the saw magnify itself against him that shaketh it? As if the rod would shake itself against them that lift it up, or the staff should lift up itself as if there were no as if it were no wood. So God's response is, wait, I said you're the you're the rod in my hand, you're an axe. Axes don't turn around and start chopping the people who are holding them. <laughs> the people who hold them are in charge, and I'm holding you, and I've I'm gonna use you for a purpose. I've used you for a purpose. But when I'm done, watch out. Uh, therefore shall the Lord, the Lord of hosts, send among his fat ones leanness, and under his glory he shall kindle a burning, like the burning of a fire, and the light of Israel shall be a for a fire, and his holy one for a flame, and it shall burn and devour his thorns and briars in one day, and shall consume the glory of his forest and his fruitful field, both body and soul, and they shall be as when a standard bearer fainteth. The image here is between what Assyria does and what's going to happen to it through the agency of God's providence and his people. The whole Middle East is going to, once this beautiful forest in a figure like Lebanon, is going to be left so there's hardly anything, the image of a standard bearer fainting. You know, the guy who holds up that, that big flag or banner that marks where the emperor is. And imagine you see it and it begins to totter and to sway and eventually, boom, falls down. And that's how the trees, that's how the great kingdoms of the Middle East are going to look. You look and, oh, look, there's one. Oh, wait, it's tottering. It's tottering. Oh, it just fell down. Oh, then there's, no, then there's, no, it's gone already. Oh, ooh, that one's on fire. Oh, it's all, 
they're going to look across the Middle East and there's not going to be much left. The rest of the trees of his forest shall be few that a child may write them. And it goes on in that, that theme for a little while. Um, the Middle East is a forest. Assyria is coming along as an axe, is chopping things down, but he gets cocky. So God takes the axe and turns it on itself and takes down the whole forest until there's hardly anything left at all. The Middle East is going to be a wasteland. Now you ask, how is this good news? Well, you were all concerned about Assyria, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> good news. Assyria is the least of your worries. <laughs> yeah. that's. Eh. But how can God pro possibly fulfill his promises now? And chapter 11 then, we come to the, the pinnacle of the Christmas sermon. He bids us look out over this forest, this bunch of stumps. And he says, there shall come forth a rod out of the stem or out of the root of Jesse. And a branch shall grow out of his roots. Look, see that, see that stump over there in the middle of Judah? Out of it, something's out of the very root, not out of the, the, the decapitated trunk, but out of the root. Something's growing, something's green, something's coming up there. What is that? The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor, reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, faithfulness the girdle of his reins. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf, the young lion, and the fatling together. A little child shall lead them, the cow and the bear shall feed. Their young ones shall lie down together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox, and the sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord, as the waters cover the seas. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. So there's God's plan, and there's the first Christmas sermon of any length. And it runs right through this thing we call Assyria. God, God has a plan for Assyria. God has a plan for this new world order thing. God has a plan for this massive empire that is one vast war machine that seems to be taking over everything everywhere. Nothing could possibly stop it. God will stop it when he's ready. Now, I, as we were talking before we started the podcast, I did mention, and I, I think I made an allusion to it earlier, there was a time when God did put it on hold for a generation. That was when Jonah went to Nineveh. Nineveh was the capital. And for one generation, Nineveh repented because God, that was part of God's plan. He needed for the judgment to come, not quite yet. He needed one generation. And so he converted an entire people and <laughs> saved horrible, horrible people. And then he let them go back to their ways in the next generation. Um, and so this whole thing of Assyria is, is taking us through Second Kings, Second Chronicles, Jonah. Also, Nahum describes the final downfall of Assyria when there is no repentance. And when it's all gone, when it's all done and all gone, it just evaporated from history. Nineveh was abandoned, buried. The other major Assyrian cities were lost. The deserts reclaimed them. So that by the time we get to the late 1800s, uh, liberal critics of the Bible were saying, Assyrians, there were never any such people. <laughs> We've never heard of them. There's no significant reference any place except people maybe quoting the Bible. That It's just the Bible made this one up wholesale. These people did not exist. This is none of a place. It's a fig figment of, of religious fanaticism from just before the time of Christ. Didn't happen. Didn't exist. And then one young man... Um, De La Tante on his way to uh, the Far East, the height of the, of the British Empire, to look for a job, stumbled across <laughs> this town called Mosul and um, was told, yeah, on the other side of the river, on the side of the Tigris, that big mound over there, yeah, don't go there. The demons come out at night. There are weird things there. You don't want to go there, Englishman. It's scary. So, of course, like any good young Englishman of about 20-something, he goes there. <laughs> And starts digging around and in time begins to find artifacts and then eventually hires native diggers and they start uncovering huge statues, winged lions with the heads of kings. And so he discovered Nineveh. The man's name was Henry David Laird, who I've mentioned 
on other occasions. Uh, and whose biography I'm going to recommend in our recommendations. Uh, but at, at, by the time they were done um, excavating and uh, I'm tempted to say looting um, <laughs> the ruins of because most Fine of line. the stuff most of the stuff went to the British Museum, which is where I first saw a lot of the stuff. Some of it eventually went to the Louvre. You know, because fortunately, Nineveh is not around to ask for it back. It became the Assyrians had the, the the library of clay tablets that they left behind. Cuneiform was discovered, translated. We we now probably know more about Nineveh than and the Assyrian Empire than we do about most other uh, empires of that time, because the desert sands just preserved it all until mm -hmm. the time was right for God to say, "Yeah, look at this." <laughs> Um, hey, look at this cool thing I made that you forgot about. Oh, I heard people were doubting me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and so you don't see that as in uh, things the Bible got wrong. You don't see that one anymore. <laughs> uh, it's gone the way of all lots of things. Uh, time archaeology have showed that the Bible knew exactly what it was talking about. In terms, again, of just perf uh, personal piety. Uh, I have lived through a couple generations now, the one before mine and my own, seeing a little bit of it in, in the generation that you are at the head of, and my students are somewhere in the middle, this um, fearfulness of conspiracies, of power blocks, of a new world order. I've mentioned before, my father was a conspiracy theorist, or at least belonged. He read all the literature that came out of those circles. And that's where I got to know things I probably would maybe be just as well not knowing about. Hopefully God will use it in some sense. But there was this constant, um, the other side's powerful. It's, there's conspiracies, there's armies, there's, there's a will to win, and American people are soft and stupid. And if we could only educate them, but they won't listen. And before long, I don't know how many times I was told as a young man growing up, that I would live to see the fall of the United States. It was just a sort of a for, foregone conclusion. Because they, the other side was strong, we were weak, we wouldn't stand up to them, and sooner or later, either simply by uh, inner corruption, the uh, communist conspiracy putting people in progressively higher places until they could just take the government, or by outside threat, they had more missiles. All they had to do was knock out ours in one round and then hold us hostage that way or some other way. I was told I would, I would see the United States fall during my lifetime, during my young lifetime. You know what it's like to grow up in the shadow of that? <laughs> uh, and if I hadn't been studying biblical prophecy at, from a very different perspective at that time, that could have been very traumatizing, very frightening, very... Um, well, this is the end of history. Why should I do anything? I'm this. My life's going nowhere. I'm never going to live in a free land or have children in a free land. Let's just give it all up. And there are still people today who look at modern conditions and say, well, let's just give it up. The only solution is for Jesus to come back. They actually cannot conceive of any alternative to the bad guys winning, taking over, sending us all to, you know, uh, slave camps or execution chambers, but the return of Jesus. And mm -hmm. there, well, there are some who are willing to admit that Jesus may not come until after all that's happened. There are others who say, well, we're America. We don't suffer. We're, we're obviously out of here real fast. <laughs> um, our, uh, our friend uh, Josh, who teaches at the school, hi, Josh, if you're listening, uh, walked into uh, our, our drama classroom, which is which might have contained his fifth grade class. He wasn't sure he was looking for them. He said, "My Welcome my fifth graders, right? yeah, my fifth graders have all been raptured. I don't know where they are." So I went to my room, and there was no one there. And now you guys are here, and there. I don't know what's going on. And he he went out saying um, something like, um, "So Kirk Cameron was right all along." And we were around the corner. Um, Get with the times. It's Nicolas Cage now. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a remake. Yeah, I forgot. I've never seen that. Have you seen that nope. particular version? No. No, 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 no. no. I, I was already forced to sit costs. through the first one. <laughs> oh. Um, um, yeah, uh, my mom was reflecting on that phenomenon recently where she says, yeah, when I was a kid, you know, all the news was Russia's got the bombs. We're going to hide under our desks. We're going to do the drills, everything. Yeah. Um, 
and then we went out and played, had a normal outside childhood. Yeah. Um, people don't do that anymore. No. So the the terror that the the next generation lives in isn't as mitigated <laughs> even as it was in your day. No. Uh, it, it, it was the media and the government pushed that mm-hmm. because you, you, I don't know if you remember the expression better red than dead, mm-hmm. uh, better Marxist than dead. Uh, and, and the conservatives responded better dead than red, uh, but freedom is something worth dying for. But that was a generation here. We're talking about the late fifties on into the sixties and brings us to the student revolution, the flower children, the hippies and all that. Mm-hmm. These were young people who were afraid to die. Mm-hmm. And we're seeing that again in our generation, the, the whole COVID thing. A lot of what happened was people were afraid to die. Mm-hmm. I mean, they were afraid that they would die and they were going to do whatever they could to not let that happen uh, to ridiculous have, extremes at times. I have bad news for yes. everyone. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> none of us is getting out of this alive. <laughs> yeah, none of us is getting us out of life. I, uh, did I tell you this joke? If it counts as a joke, my wife and I were watching um, um, some stand up comedian. He was he based his routine on statistics, which has got to be a weird way of doing stand-up comedy. <laughs> but it was mildly humorous. And he was looking at how marriage is in about divorce. And he said, you know, 40% of all marriages end in divorce. I don't know if that's a true statistic, but that's the one he gave. And everyone said, yeah, yeah, yeah. no, but wait, think about it backwards. That means 60% of all marriages end in death. <laughs> that is <laughs> the alternative, isn't it? <laughs> Uh, like, no one's uh, getting out of this world alive. Um, but you know what? My generation thought they would. Mine was the generation that was absolutely convinced that Jesus Christ would come back in their lifetime to the point of not, pre- not going to college, not getting married, not pursuing careers. Because why? Jesus was coming back. I mean, it was it was like Nicene Creed, Formula of Chalcedon, and Jesus is coming back before 1980. It was as seriously believed. And if you didn't believe it, then, oh, I'm sorry, you're one of those kind of Christians. I didn't know you were liberal. <laughs> because a, a literal interpretation they thought meant inevitably that Jesus was coming back within my generation. It'd be interesting to go to some of those people now and say, has your eschatology changed? Oftentimes it hasn't. They just keep blindly pushing the goalposts. Okay, so it wasn't 1980, it was 2000, no, 2010, no, 2020. Well, you know, sometime within my ge- generation, maybe it's in 40 years, it's more like 70 years. Maybe a generation is like 100 years. Maybe it's, you know, generationally something-ish. But the one certainty is that it's not worth investing in a retirement fund. Oh, that, you know. Oh, my. Because Jesus That would be an back. act of disbelief. Yeah. Yeah. That's where we ended up. The uh, the young man who visited our Bible study the other day was um, seems like a very nice young man. He was, um, but he he's from a Slavic country, shall we say, from a Slavic background, Slavic church, and he pre- very much appreciated our Bible study. But at the end, as we were just asking him questions about his own background, which was quite interesting, mm-hmm. um, he began to pick up the traditional dispensational line about the future of Russia. Mm-hmm. Russia's going to uh, rise and be a major power. It's going to invade Israel. Israel's going to respond. And this is what's described in Ezekiel and in Daniel 11. And it was, it was, it was amazing to see this thing that was brewed in America, mostly, then got transported across the seas <laughs> to non-American nations, non-English-speaking <laughs> nations, and put roots there. And then these people have come back, and they're as sure of our stupid ideas as we are. And it's very sad, rather than the hope we could have given them. He, he described the time when, when the Iron Curtain came down and the Soviet Union fell, and these the Christian churches and surrounding former satellites were sending in missionaries. I did not know that had happened. That praise God, but they're sending in missionaries who again have a, base, a basic dispensational mindset, which means this is temporary, and one day Russia will rise and invade Israel and set off the sequence that leads to Armageddon. So I don't know if we'll ever get as far as talking about some of those things. Maybe we should. Uh, maybe someplace there should be something people can point to and say, here's an alter, alternative uh, exposition of Ezekiel that doesn't include Russia. <laughs> um, 
Because most people say, no, that's that's what that's about, right? Uh, Magog, that's uh, Meshach. Meshach is Moscow. Tubal is Tobolsk. No, they're not actually, but it, it's not enough for me to say they're not because it's very deeply ingrained in people mm -hmm. who study prophecy from that perspective. Yeah. I mean, the, the good news to that is it's so deep that you can correct it before you get there. In a sense, if you have time. If you have time. <laughs> you know, that's, that's the, the struggle is having time. But eschatology is the ultimate things, not because it's the the end of the world things, but because it's the the last thing you get to, you know? Well, it's the last it's, thing you get to, except that it's the first thing you get to. Mm -hmm. I mean, eschatology is simply God wins. You know, we make that joke, hey, I've read the end of the book, God wins. Yes. <laughs> what does winning look like? And when we know that, then suddenly everything that leads up to it makes sense. Mm -hmm. If if you read, you know the 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 final script for some future Star Wars movie, and it said, "And the galaxy all died that day," we would say, "What? No, wait, what? No, that's not the story." Or if we read a Jane Austen novel, and so all of the sisters took poison and died together. No, Jane Austen <laughs> doesn't end that way. Well, Jesus <laughs> Bible. And so the end is in the beginning, and the beginning is in the end. And the whole question is, what kind of God do we have anyway? Does God abandon the plan he set before humanity, or does he find an even cooler, better, neater way to bring it to pass in an even bigger way than he originally said? Or did God just give up and that, ah, let's save some souls from heaven, close enough. It's close enough. <laughs> so eschatology does matter, but it's the fruit of your soteriology and your theology. What kind of God do we have? And what exactly is the salvation business? When we know that, then that's going to lead us into the resurrection. It's also going to show us where history's going. So this is one of, this was something I was going to ask you all about, and I'll ask you another time. But I think at some point we probably should stop and just talk to our audience and say, this is why we think we're doing what we're doing. I think that'd be a great podcast. And so maybe not next time or the time after, but sometime before too long. Let, let's think about doing that. And we all have our different perspectives, I'm sure. We've never sat down. By the way, audience, we've never sat down and said, here's our plan. This is what we're doing. We just said, hey, we're <laughs> friends. Let's talk about the stuff. There's um, a plan? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is there a plan? Well, I, I kind of have one, but I've never tried to impose anything on you two or any of our <laughs> visitors. So um, my my uh, one of my daughters was um, trying to figure out her calling and whether or not she's called to be a... Christian school teacher and such, and she just was kind of going frantic. And her mom said, well, why don't you ask your, your dad why he's a Christian school teacher, or at least why he does what he does? And at first she wasn't going to. <laughs> I don't know if she didn't care or if she thought it was embarrassing or something. But finally she didn't. I think, I, 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 this is what I said. I don't, think it, I don't think she understood. I said, I'm fighting for the life of the world. Grandiose, hubris, uh, inflated ego. <laughs> I hope not. I don't mean that I'm going to make the change, but I'm hoping I'm part of an army, maybe very, very tiny, small part, but part of a gospel army that's goal is to change the world, to save the life of the world that Jesus has already saved. We're working out the salvation he purchased by bringing truth to people. And the privilege of doing that is greater than any other I can imagine in this life. But that's my calling, and everybody has a different calling that spins around that somehow or spins within that. And so at some time I'd like, I'd like you to think about why, why are you doing this and where, what do you hope this is going to accomplish? And if it's just talking to good friends about our Lord, that's a, still a pretty good answer. <laughs> yeah. uh, so anyway, I, th I think that that's where we can leave it. This stuff is practical. It does affect how you think about the world, how you read the headlines. It's a question of what your faith looks like. Do Are you afraid of men? Are you afraid of nations and empires? Are you afraid of conspiracies? Are you afraid of takeovers? Or do you really believe that God's God and that he not only can deal with this, they're here because he wants them here. He's got a plan for them. And when that plan's done, he'll get rid of them. They're never the threat. The person we ought to be afraid of is God himself. We should There's the even a whole God. verse about that. Yeah. Fear not the verse. one who can kill the body, <laughs> yeah, but fear the one who can destroy both body and soul. Exactly. Yeah. And that's in the New Testament. Ha, ha. <laughs> what? <laughs> All right. We should wrap up and do some 
rapid fire recommendations. Uh, Greg, you already said you had one lined up. Yeah, so. and unfortunately, I ju I just closed the document that had the name on it. So and it was I'm, the biography of Henry yeah, David Laird. Yeah, or Austin Henry Laird. Sorry, I don't um, know where Henry David came from. <laughs> the row. <laughs> <laughs> The uh, it's the it's the biography of Henry David Laird, the man who we discovered. No, now you're saying it. Yeah, I, no, that's mine. Yeah, what? it's written by Arnold C. Brackman. No, but it's his name is Austin Henry Laird. Oh, I'm sorry. I am sorry. <laughs> I said Henry David because I was thinking of Thoreau. <laughs> and yeah, then me I too. And off. I in in my the novel I'm working on, or actually the role playing game behind and the novel behind <laughs> the role. Anyway, there's a character I have named David Laird. Okay. Uh. <laughs> so, yeah, it's Austin. Yes, Austin Henry. Lear. I am so sorry. The book is by Arnold C. Brackman. It's called The Luck of Nineveh in Search of the Lost Assyrian Empire. It's it's not about all the history we just talked about. It's about the history, the story of this young one man in the late Victorian era, an era when any good Britisher could make his fortune by going to the far corners of the British Empire, which, as we know, the, never, the sun never set upon. And could find an office working for some uncle or grandfather or something someplace and make a small fortune and come back with uh, tropical plants and, you know, settle in Britain and appear in an Agatha Christie novel. Um, <laughs> that. But this young man didn't. He got distracted by adventures and by archaeology and along the way discovered Nineveh. He was also at various times a writer, a teacher, a sacred agent. He dealt with uh, sheiks with um, Desert Bandits. He sounds incredibly like it, the, the prototype for Indiana Jones. <laughs> so if you like biographies, if you like adventure stories, you not know, super wild adventure, but stuff happens. Uh, I think you would enjoy this. So The Luck cool. of Nineveh in Search of a Lost Assyrian Empire. Awesome. I'm going to recommend Phineas and Ferb. <laughs> Speaking of mummies and... Uh, discovering something excellent, that excellent wasn't thought choice. to exist. Um, yeah, it's it's a very light kids show that is nevertheless highly entertaining. Um, every so often there's a song with clever lyrics like about what... So the, the premise is Phineas and Ferb are two stepbrothers who have a summer vacation and every day they're like, Psh, what are we going to do today? And so like in one episode, they have a chariot race because they went to the museum and they're like, let's do this thing. And the humor is that it's ridiculously to scale, right? The chariot race is across town and they've got spiked chariot wheels and the whole bit. And the sister is always trying to tell on the brothers, say, mom, look what they're doing. They're making a total mess. This is so dangerous. Get them in trouble. But due to circumstances it always vanishes by the time mom comes <laughs> to actually look but yeah so there was a song about the chariot race that was my anachronistic wagon and it's fun <laughs> okay <laughs> i still think one of my favorite lines is a little throwaway line they basically filled a pool with jello mix and made it into <laughs> something bouncy and at <laughs> one point it gets hit because part of the show's other plot line is always about a secret agent platypus mm -hmm. fighting an evil genius and the evil <laughs> genius always has some some kind of um innator uh, yeah. so he has an evil innator ray and it hits <laughs> the pool of jello and it turns into a monster and walks off and phineas turns to the group of his friends and goes all right who added the evil powder and everyone looks at raj <laughs> the indian kid and goes it's curry it's not inherently evil. <laughs> okay, you're getting me interested now. Yeah, it's funny. Where, you, it's like where, 10 where can you find this? 10 minute episodes. Um, it's available not for free. With I think it's on Disney Amazon. Plus now. Oh, sure. If you're giving Disney money. <laughs> 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 Which hmm. is fine. A fine thing to do. I just don't. Sure. Uh, so, yeah, I'm not no, currently giving Disney money, so whatever. <laughs> Um, for my, I have two recommendations. The first one is I'm going to recommend if you're going to hold to modern doctrinal statements, mm -hmm. uh, you should also hold to historic doctrinal statements like the creeds. <laughs> um, this sounds like a subtweet. <laughs> it's very much a subtweet. There's a group, of, uh, a handful of people I can I can think of. I will not name them right now, uh, who 
throw a lot of shade at things like the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, the Constantinopolitan Creed, the uh, Chalcedonian definition, because they're adding to scripture and you shouldn't use them as standards. But then they're also out here, you know, talking about Nashville statements and uh, Chicago statements on NRC yeah. and et cetera. And those so things are all out fine. The early church was also facing problems and having to say things about yeah. them. <laughs> yeah, they were, yeah. and they should be listened to um so that's like that's the first recommendation um and the second one is uh i just finished listening to the audiobook which is read by the author of carl truman's rise and triumph of the mm. modern self and it's phenomenal mm. very brilliant he doesn't really st- st- stop at any one point to be like and this is why it's wrong according to christianity it's very much just a historical account of um, Descartes to Rousseau through the 19th century romantics to the modern oh, that view sounds of, fascinating. of what self-identity is in the West. And it's fun, it, it's really interesting. So that's my my second so recommendation. So what's, what's the title again? Because I think I need this. The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self, Carl Truman. Okay, I, I'll remember Carl Truman. Okay. Awesome. Cool. Well, thank you guys so much for this conversation. It's been a pleasure. I look forward to next week. Thank you also to David our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. Uh, Thanks also to you, our listeners. We appreciate you tuning in. I hope you've enjoyed this show as much as we enjoyed making it. Thank you also to our financial supporters. We appreciate you keeping the show rolling. Um, If you'd like to join their number, you can visit our website, anchor.fm slash halting towards Zion. And if you'd like to get in touch with us for any reason, um, as my mother used to say, comments, questions, brouquets, brouquets, bouquets, brickbats, or as my Greek teacher used to say, questions, comments, insults. Um, <laughs> halting towards Zion at gmail.com is the best way to get in touch with us. Send us an email. Thanks so much. See you next time.